Welcome back to the course, Church-Based Marketplace Ministry, Session 3. At the end of Session 2, we were reminded that the church is not a building, but it's the people. We learned that the programs do not solve problems, people solve problems. In Session 3, we're going to evaluate two different models of the church and answer the question, do we lead a people that go to the church, or do we lead a church that go to the people? Be sure to follow along in your workbook as we go. Let me start out with a question. How often do you go to church? We've asked this question to thousands of uh, participants or around the world, and you come up with many different, uh, different answers. Sometimes it's two times, occasionally one, but more often it's three times. But we had one pastor stand up and says, I just live at the church. Well, we know that that wasn't quite accurate. But here, here's another question for you. In your church, your local church, wherever it's at, how, how often does the average person attend church? And again, we get different answers, but it would seem that, that once or twice is really what the average is. But what we need to do is understand what the definition, from a biblical point of view, of church is. Because if we don't get that right, then we can't get our leadership style right. Church is the Greek word, comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and it means the called out ones. And someone once said, well, yes, we're called out of the world in order to be prepared for heaven. But in reality, we're called out of darkness into the splendid light of Jesus that we might be his agents in the land of darkness around us. It's a vehicle God has chosen. It's a weapon that was not predicted in the Old Testament, but was revealed in the, in the New Testament as a primary agent of God to fulfill the, the purpose of reconciliation and redemption that comes through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Church is used to describe the local assembly of believers over 109 times in the New Testament. But it can also refer in a number of times for the universal church. So when we talk about church, it's always about people. It's not about a place or a building. It's about the people of God who have committed themselves to following the kingdom of God. Our definitions define our understanding, and our understanding defines our actions. Change the definition, and you'll change the actions and how people think. When church is a building, it changes how we see and understand the purpose of church, which should be the people of God. Church gathers on Sunday and church is scattered on Monday through Saturday for its mission. One of the th terms that we'll use over and over again is the church gathered and the church scattered because we want to, to begin to help people see and understand that church isn't a place you go, it's a people who go. What's the purpose of the church gathered? It's to prepare the church believers to be salt, light, and leaven when scattered on mission. In government, we define marketplace as government, education, and business. So as people come into the, the church, they're equipped, or as people become the church, they are equipped to fulfill their calling in all spheres of the marketplace, including government, education, and business. So I'd like to look at two specific models of, uh, of church. Jeremiah in 6.16 tells the people who were getting ready to go in exile because of disobedience, he says this, stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. And I believe with all of my heart that the church is at a crossroads. If we continue down where the majority of the church is traveling, the end result will be what we've always gotten and not about the revival and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. So we've got to look very carefully, which road do we want to travel? Which road do we travel? Too many Christians see church as a place to come and get, uh, rather than gathered to receive. But there is another road less traveled. It is called the come to go. And in that, you're, the church is, is equipped to be scattered throughout the community. On the first road, the church is a building where people get, go to get blessed and refreshed and healed. And again, 
there's nothing wrong with those things, but they're not an end in themselves. They're, it's incomplete to leave it there. The other church is called the church to come to get. The building is where the church gathers to become equipped to serve God through being scattered the rest of the week. You know, God called Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. And God has called us, each one of us who claim Jesus as Lord, to be a blessing to the na uh, nations. We are blessed by God in order to be a blessing for God as representative of his light and truth. We use an illustration, and if you'd like to look in your book now, you can see that illustration. There's two squares, and in those squares, there's a hundred uh, circles. And in the first square, it shows a, a small group of those circles in the corner as being uh, together in a slightly different color, a gray color. The other, uh, other square shows those uh, circles in, uh, spread throughout, not grouped up, spread throughout the, uh, the area of the box up against the other circles of different color. The point is this, that when we gather in the, in the building as the church, we're equipped in order to be scattered through the population in order to be liked and leavened. That's the primary purpose and the calling that we have as Christians. We're in sense, these work together. We're, we, we are uh, gathered to be scattered and we're gathered again in, 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 in training and equipping. We call this whole life discipleship. And if we are to see the transformation of communities that people want, we've got to start with ensuring that we are equipping and discipling every believer to be a, is a discipler within that community, not simply running programs, but being who God has made them to be, and that's a reflection of his glory. God is calling us to become the church in the marketplace rather than building in the neighborhood. What kind of church do you prefer? One where you come to get, or one where you're, you come to be trained to go? Because how you view the church and how you view the purpose of the church gathered determines the kind of church you'll be when scattered. A local church does not have one parish. It has many. Every believer who comes in to the parish of the pastor, which is, is uh, as the church gathers, also has different parishes in which they will work when they are sent out and gathered, uh, scattered. Parish could be your marriage. Parish could be the, uh, your family. The parish could be many different areas where you have influence. Every parish where you have, uh, every parish represents the influence that you have in a particular sphere. And so rather than thinking simply of the parish of where the building of the church is located, we need to start reframing our mind and think of parish as something that uh, each and every one of us have in multiple ways. When people come into the church, how do you greet them? How do you, how do you talk to them about your, your local church, your, your church gathered? Too often, what we want to do is, when new members come in, is find them a place. Yeah, we can teach Sunday school. You're, you're great with youth people. Um, you can help uh, be on the, the uh, committee for, for uh, overseeing uh, some of the buildings. But in reality, what we really need to be, if we're doing this the way God intends, is that we need to, when people join the church, to ask, how can we, as your brothers and sisters, as the church, help you be successful in your parish or your different parishes. Because it is about equipping, not as simply serving the building and the, and the church gathered, but serving Christ as the church when we are scattered. The church gathers to, to disciple to purpose by equipping believers to be salt, light, and leaven in the community. You know, my son recently uh, retired from the military, and he was sharing with me that, that whenever they do training, they have to go into a building in order to learn how to be the church, or how to be the military, and when they're on maneuvers, when they are going out and, and having to, to conduct themselves as an army conducts themselves. 
And that's a, an illustration for us. When we have the church coming in, uh, how do we treat them? Do we treat them as if that is the only place that, that they really are the church? Or do we treat them as coming in in order to be trained and equipped to be the church when they're scattered out? The goal is this, the kingdom of God in the midst of the kingdom of darkness to establish God's rule over all creation. One of the things that we have to, to break down, is, and we mentioned this last time, is the sacred-secular divide. We've got to stop thinking that there's some things sacred and some things that are secular. And we've got to start looking at the whole process as an attempt to reclaim that which the enemy has stolen. Jesus has redeemed the whole world, including us, including creation, as we'll see later on. But, but what we need to do is go where the uh, darkness is the, the darkest in order to reclaim as God's army, as God's citizens, that which has been unclaimed. And the marketplace in many, many countries that we've traveled in is seen as a necessary evil rather than a divine opportunity. One of the things that we have to remember is that every believer, wherever they go, carry the light of Christ. It's literally the reflection of Christ through us. And when we have that in mind, then that light that God has given us to take, go into dark places becomes that which will chase away the darkness. Because one candle will chase away the darkest of darkest nights, will chase away the darkness of the deepest corners when that light is brought to bear. We need not fear either the enemy or even the people who are around because we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And as ambassadors with the light of Christ, our task is not only to do our work as unto the Lord, but it is to allow Christ to work through us to bring that light to where it's dark, to the people around us that don't know Christ. The church of tomorrow will discover the power of the single light in the midst of the dark night. While we must be ready to give answer, uh, we must also be living out as citizens of the kingdom. In other words, it's how you live, not simply what you say. As one uh, theologian said, that uh, let your life speak volumes before a word is uttered from your mouth. In Psalms 139, we're told that we're created on purpose by God. There's no one who's watching this it is an accident. God has created you for such a time as this. But it's in Ephesians 2.10 that we learn that, that we are and can be God's handiwork, God's workmanship to do the good works that God has given us to do from times before we were even conceived of that God had these works that we're to do, then he has called us to, to do them. There are three key resources that God uses in this whole process. One is talent. Now, I've never considered myself very talented, but as I studied the scriptures, I realized that God has given me gifts. There are things that I can do that, that are exceptional as far as God's gifting to me. And also I've been created with, with certain talents and abilities and I need to, to use those for the glory of God, and I need to enhance them. I can learn better. I can go to, to training. I can uh, uh, practice as an apprentice. But there's also God has given us treasure, and treasure may be a bit of a broad uh, title or name, but the fact is that we have some financial resources, nearly all of us do. And I think of the widow's might. When the widow came and gave her might, she had so little, but God blessed us in so many big ways. We have the same way. We have whatever resources that God has entrusted to us to be used for what he wants us to do with it. Now, can we increase that? Sure, if we can get a better job, if we can invest or, or move somewhere to, to work in a different position. But there's one gift one uh, resource that is non-renewable. Once it's gone, it's gone. You, you probably can guess which one that is. It's time itself. The thing with time is that uh, you only have so much, and none of us know the day in which we'll be called from this world. 
time is the only non-renewable resource that's mentioned. So the question is, what are we going to do with our time? I've talked with some pastors in uh, different parts of the world, and they believe that they need to spend their time trying to get more people to come to their church. Now, when you start looking at how much time we spend in different things, this becomes an issue. If you look on your, on your uh, notes, you'll see a circle, it's uh, a graph, and in that graph, it'll tell us how we, in, in big ways, spend our time. 36% of our time, most of it, for most people, is spent in either going to work, working, or coming back from work. Uh, the next biggest bucket is rest or sleep, and we spend about 32% of our time in sleep and rest. This is over a given week. And then uh, about 28% with family and meals and entertainment. But how much time does the average person spend at church? Historically and presently, that's about 4% of their total time. That's incredible because we have so little time for developing the people that God has given us to, for the purposes of God when they're scattered and they're doing those other things. So rather than trying to get people to come by enticing them to, to some kind uh, of program or project, what we need to do is ask ourselves, how does God want us to spend this time? What is it that we need to do with the little time that we have that will multiply the, uh, the potential of those believers who have come in as the church? When they're scattered, what are they taking with them? And I guarantee you, no matter how good your sermon on Sunday, that is a small thing that they'll take with them, maybe. But if you equip them to do the work of ministry and train them as ministers or, or priests, as Peter says, and in the, wherever they're at, in the marketplace, whatever job they're on, that multiplies itself because now they are living out the good news where they're at, ready to give answer for whatever it is that, that uh, questions that are asked. What should the church be focused on when it gathers? Let me quote from Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Now, what is the responsibility of these, this five-fold ministry? Too often when I'm with people, they, they tell me that, that they are a pastor by office, an evangelist by office. But that's not what it's talking about here. What it's talking about here is a gifting in order to work with the local uh, congregation, with the church gathered, in order to equip them how to do the things that I'm gifted with. As a pastor, I am a, an example of how you and I, uh, if we have families, might pastor our own families, or in our parish is a certain job in a place, how do, that I can pastor the people by the grace of God where I'm at. So it, the gifts teach us how to walk out those things that God wants us to do. Does an evangelist, is he the only one that does evangelism? No. In fact, his primary role is to help us understand what evangelism really is, and so on and so forth. So when we look at these gifts, and they're calling to equip us to walk those out in our workplace, in our homes, then it changes the focus of the church from that which we get and always wanting to receive to that which is given to empower us to be the church wherever God would lead us. The gifts of Ephesians 4.11 is to equip, equip God's people and when they're scattered. I love what one pastor said when, when he, he mulled this over and thought, thought about it. And he says, you know, Sunday is like garage time. When my car has problems, I, I take it to the, to the garage and, and they fix it. And, and part of, of Sunday, he says, I think should be that, that type of time. We go in certainly to be equipped, but we also go in to be repaired and, and to, to, to be strengthened for the week that is coming that's following. Uh, Henry Blackaby says that the marketplace is the last mission frontier. Christianity in the marketplace is salt and light in a dark world. And I think that he is quite right. Because if we do not 
take our battle, so to speak, if we do not take the gospel in, if we do not see that every, every Christian that has joined together when they're gathered is not also a light and a, and a witness to where they're at, we will fail. We cannot achieve the Great Commission without the aid of every person who is a, a follower of Jesus because every person is called to be an ambassador and a priest to be light and leaven. And once that builds into our mind, then it's going to affect the way we do church. We need to follow God's plan of how to do church, do church in his way, uh, or we'll risk missing the connection. I think of uh, a bridge I saw one time. It was a, a, I don't know, a drawing or a photocopy. And they started building the bridge coming this way. And, and the other people began to build the bridge coming this way. And when they got right next to each other, they realized they were off by a few meters. And unlike the bridge, ours has eternal consequences. If we're off by even a little bit, then we've got to ask ourselves, how much are we accomplishing and what are we accomplishing? We believe that God has called us to reclaim that which the enemy has stolen because Jesus is the one who has paid for it. And I think we need to understand that when it comes to the marketplace, when it comes to, to commerce and economy, this is not a necessary evil, but it's the road that we travel in order to accomplish the purposes of, of God in our generation. And I would like to, to challenge you to give some thought, some serious thought of, of how you do church and what is God calling you to do when you come to realize that Jesus is Lord of all. He's redeemed all, and we are in the process of reclaiming. So thank you for joining me on this session. Uh, starting uh, next uh, session, we'll be looking at uh, the church and at its responsibility to follow the three great uh, commandments. So let me close right now in prayer. Father, we do bless you and praise you. We exalt you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you reign. Lord, help us to be part and parcel of our, your calling, your church, in order to reclaim what the enemy has stolen. We declare our allegiance to you. Father, bless all those that are listening and hearing. May your Holy Spirit enlighten them and teach them. In Jesus' name, amen.